straighters are getting paid in different ways, right? And there's something that's called smart contracts as well. And smart contracts allow you to set up essentially um, however you want the deal to be. I'm 19 keys. Tap in. Now, some of you all gonna have to do some of your research on this, but if you study artificial intelligence, smart contracts, non-fungible tokens, also you need to study crypto ETFs, you understand me? Um, and that's something that I believe is gonna be huge in the now and in the future. But a lot of the utility for the blockchain, which is basically the system that all of this runs on to make sure that it's safe, that you can trust it, a lot of this hasn't been truly identified and used in the best of manner yet, right? Like blockchain is really one of the greatest um, technologies of our era, better than the light bulb, better than a bunch of different things. Okay, I like the light bulb, I like to see. But what I'm saying is that a lot of people don't understand how much the world has shifted and the opportunities that exist right now because of this shift. So when I look at blockchain, when I first seen it, I remember making a video about it in 2017 and explaining how Bitcoin and cryptocurrency was the new internet. It was bigger than the internet. You understand me? Because of what it represented, the sovereignty it represented, the independence that it represented. And I remember talking about how once our people specifically get a hold of it, we're going to figure out all of these creative ways to learn how to use it. Right? So right now, the poor starving artist is going to be no more of a story, right? It's, it's no longer sexy to be a, a poor starving artist. The starving artist makes no sense. If you're a starving artist, it's because you're not creative enough, right? Now, what I say about this, somewhere, somewhere right now, somebody's happy with a starving artist story. They say, you know what? No, I want to be a starving artist. That's the art. I don't want the money. Capitalism takes away from the faux pas the art. Right, you got all, the, you got them people, right? And that's fine, they can stay over there, right? In the studio apartment struggling to pay their rent because they are passionate about the art. But then what happens is that the tools made it so possible that all you gotta do is get a little creative on how you push out your art and the way you set up your business model towards how the public perceives your art and you can also get compensated for your art, right? So for me, it's taking the business models and learning how to apply creativity with them. This is essentially what it is. And what you have is you have the technology already built by the smart people. So now all you gotta do is figure out how can I be the most creative and utilize them in the best way, right? Now, you're gonna get paid for your creativity all day long. Why? Why is creativity one of the most valuable things running right now? Because it's one of those lists of valuable skill sets that I teach in the wealth standard against artificial intelligence. See, the artificial intelligent machine, the deep learning, machine learning, they don't have creativity, right? That's a human possession. They don't have imagination. So these things become powerful. Vision becomes powerful because you learn how to take the tools that are set and use them in manners that haven't been thought of before, right? So creative business models is going to be the most um, necessary skill set for the entrepreneur in the now and in the future. You also have something, if you go look up Microsoft HoloLens, right? I'm gonna be teaching a little more on some of these things. Microsoft HoloLens is a project that they're pushing out, still in beta and prototype stage, where you can have spatial reality. And spatial reality essentially allows you to put these glasses on, or maybe context when you get to that point. And the digital assets that you buy, let's say as NFTs, you can now actually have them in your real world, right? Now, it's basically like putting a filter over your eyes, but instead you can actually interact with it. Imagine being able to interact with a digital computer that you can pick up, you can move, it sits there in the air. When you tap it, it actually is tapping the keyboard. Spatial reality. Imagine being able to hang up some of those digital paintings that you buy when you walk in a house and people have on their glasses. They can see everywhere you hung up the painting, right? It brings a different value to why NFTs in a digital world are valuable in the first place, right? Now, when you start to understand um, when you start to understand the value of NFTs again, it's also about like, I got so many business ideas, I'm not gonna share them on this particular live because 
you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm really, this ain't the free game I'm gonna give away. On, uh, when I do the master class, I'll give away some of the, my, my case, my use cases on how I'm gonna utilize it, right? And how I think that other people can utilize it to bring them a really big bag, to foster them a community and to have a future utilizing some of these tools. NFT is anything but just another tool, right? Now, the one thing I want y'all to think about is this. Here's the danger of the NFT community that I'm seeing, and this happens all the time, and this really just goes to the PC courtship. Anytime there's something new, you have gatekeepers that get into the community, they have success, they are early educators in the space, some of them are early innovators in the space, and now they feel as if you have to go through them and follow the way that they set up for this world to be concluded. Now, there's nothing wrong with the people who put in the work early, right? I believe everybody who's a advocate for the blockchain, who's an advocate for cryptocurrency, is also an advocate for NFTs, right? Because it's basically talking about all of those things that's attached, the tokens, the coins, the utility of those coins. You have a invested interest in the success and the utility cases, meaning how they're going to be used, that's going to make them adoptable for the mass society. You have an invested interest to be those to see those things successful. Now, there's nothing wrong with, like I said, people making their communities and they're making their names, but here lies the issue and the problem. They want to set the standard for how the contract should be made. What are the prices for the NFTs? Who you should talk to? Who are the the thought leaders in that particular space? Now, if you make yourself that person and you set up your world to shape, you did your part to make sure you got some power in a brand new space. But for individuals like myself and others who have a platform, right? Somebody like myself, before y'all see me on this particular social media, or they took away my badges, y'all. They said I did something, they took away my badges. They won't let me make no money off my life. So I'm, it's free game for real. You know what I'm talking about? So before y'all see me on social media, guess what? I was curating our shows. I was hosting our shows. I was doing social media for a Trap Art Collective, right? Where we traveled around the US and there was even a global presence in the UK to where we would go find all of the local artists, sign them up and curate a atmosphere to where they can sell their art. Unsigned, unhyped, undiscovered artists that were super talented. So you're talking about black and brown artists all around the world, right? Thousands and thousands of artists. So I have a vested interest in, in, in this NFT space because I've seen so many talented artists get overlooked and they're not being a platform for them to be able to share their art, get paid off of it. So somebody say, bring it back. Here's the thing, it never left. It's just a pivot, right? Unfortunately, COVID-19 did something. It destroyed the experience in the space. You understand me? It disrupted the collective and didn't allow people to be able to congregate, share their art, sell their art, get paid off their talents and their skills. So now we have the ability to be able to do it in a virtual space, in a digital world. So the pivot comes into play. And I'll be showcasing some of that content. And I'm an artist myself. I have a store, or I had a store rather, in Oakland, California, where I literally have my paintings on the wall. And I was selling my own paintings. I designed everything that you all see from the crowns, from my content, right? I draw, I sketch, I paint, I do digital graphic work, editing, the whole nine yards. So I'm an artist, I'm a designer, right? But I'm also a thought leader. I'm also, I'm a, I'm a polymathic person. My, my skill set span in many different areas. So I'm especially interested and NFTs and the blockchain and this digital world because now it allows for me to benefit from all my skill sets all at once, right? So being able to bring this collective back and to be able to have one of actually where I think it'll be uh, one of the greatest um, collections or collective of black artists in the world, that's what I'm headed towards. You understand me? And seeing black artists get paid for their art. Now, people go talk about it a lot, right? Black artists need to do this, that, and the third, right? You got somebody on here named Sean Henry. He don't believe me, right? The beautiful thing about whether people believe it or not believe it is that they're evidence, right? Now, once the evidence is presented, 
then you have to ask yourself, do I have cognitive dissonance, right? Because you can believe something to be true, evidence is presented, you can go with the truth or you can continue to go with your beliefs. That's cognitive dissonance. So with 19 Keys and other people, we have content and that content is on the internet. The internet is like our blockchain and there's proof that these transactions took place, that this reputation is real, that this character is real, that the things that I say are real. And the one thing that I love more than anything, the one thing that I put in my tank, I put in my gas, you understand me? It's an ingredient to the petroleum, is doubt. Doubt fuels. That's why I like addressing the haters. People say don't address your haters. No, oh, I gotta stop at the gas station sometime. <laughs> I love it when somebody doubt me. Oh, you ain't gonna do this, you can't do this, that's cap. Okay, I don't even wear caps, I wear crowns. You know what I'm talking about? I graduated from the cap and gown. Come on, talk to me. You know what I'm talking about? So, what we saying is, what you're going to see from the BWO is some of the most historic, futurist things being brought out from the black world, right? We've already created one of the largest wealth platforms that's going to help shift black wealth in America in the year 2000 before the targeted year 2053. And we also helping brown people in their target year is 2073, right? How do we cure the diagnosis of poverty? One way that we can cure the diagnosis of poverty is through education, right? When you enlighten people and you bridge the gap of their ignorance, you allow them to connect the dots on what to do next, right? So they can take full control and power over their life. Now, you can go to people they can teach you about credit, teach you about trust, right? Teach you about cryptocurrency, teach you about the stock market, binary options, or options. They can teach you about businesses, business model generation, product development, right? They can teach you about proper handling of people and, and a multitude of different skill sets. They can teach you about gold and, and hedging and portfolio diversification. You understand me? How to go buy you some land. A multitude of different things. And all of these things are going to help you build wealth. Right? That's the beauty of it. Like, none of, it's not, oh, you just do this one thing and that's it. No. It's bringing it all full circle and around. Right? Some of the greatest educators on credit, I see my brother him file, honey. Masterful gang. You know what I'm talking about? That's a brother y'all should follow. Another one is the Burrow Bullies. Right? Now, what did I just exercise there? Instead of saying, that, hey, y'all, I'm about to do a master class on credit. It takes, it, it, it's free for me to share information. It's free for me to give you access, right? Now, here's the thing. Do I expect the man that I just named to go spend their next five to 10 hours teaching you the game for free? No, right? But they do have free game that they put out and an absorbent amount of it. But then they also have things that they utilize to feed their family. They give you the entry level, and when you get the entry level, that's enough for you to get value, take that value, convert it into some capital, and use that capital to invest in the programs that aren't free, that have a high level of value. You know what I'm talking about? And once you start to understand that, that concept, that let me go grab everything that these people have out for free, let me utilize that information, and then once I absorb that value, I'm gonna come back and pay for the rest. <coughs> oh, bless me. Bless me for sure. Uh, the allergies out here. Where we at? Wherever we at, I'm allergic to them. Gotta get out of LA. I'm gonna go to Puerto Rico, man. Right? I don't know what's going on. So, you know, that's that's the formula, that's the game. You know you are talking about? Uh, let me see. Alright. So the Grammys, right? I want to talk about that just for a brief second. Um, I said it in my caption about Nas, right? Now, one thing I want y'all to understand about the, about the world, right? The Grammys represent institutional change, right? That they were forced to change because um, of what happened last year and the years before that, that people were boycotting the Grammys, people were tired of institutions that never served us, didn't represent us, you understand me, and were always putting out you know, on, a, on an outside and cheating the artists who actually deserve to be recognized. So, of course, Nas was nominated 14 times and he won none, right? And that was always like, 
an invalidation for the Grammys because for the Grammys to not validate one of the top artists in the world, it made no sense for them to be able to curate a, right, an award show. And that's the exact purpose of that award show. So it made no sense. So Nas, and, and, and when I look at that, you know, and his last album was called King Disease, and it's about the gluttony of, of kings and, and a multitude of different things. Nas was one of the first artists that I heard on a, on a large scale talking about, you know, the black guy protocol, talking about the mathematics, talking about the teachings, you know, having Farrakhan in his songs, talking about Farrakhan. You know, to saying hip hop is dead, and it was that was goddamn true, right? Hip hop was dead. It turned into a whole different kind of reality, right? Rap was born, and the rappers turned into little girls, right? They start wearing purses, painting their nails, you know, wearing uh, leggings, and you know, really just became a very effeminized state. So he was right. Hip hop did die. Something else was birthed, and it's called the rap game. Now. I want y'all to think about this. In 2020, we had the pandemic. Black men were used as the poster child for social justice. When black men would die, it turned into political campaigns for propaganda so that they can actually get some campaign um, donations and then they can pour that into the democratic community so that people like Joe Biden can become president. Right, like Kamala, if it wasn't for dead black men, there would be no Kamala Harris as president. There would be no Joe Biden as president, right? If it wasn't for dead black men being murdered in the street, Black Lives Matter would have not been able to capitalize off those bodies and raise $90 million and not give that money to the families and having them fight for donations, right? If it wasn't for you know, these black men such as Oscar Grant, such as Mike Brown, and a multitude of others, would Nas ever have won a Grammy? Maybe eventually. But would he have won a Grammy this year? See, Black Lives Matter, when they went global, it became known as the biggest civil rights movement in history because it was on a global stage and you have more people around the world participating than ever before, right? So if it wasn't for dead black men and you know, Nas raps against accidental murderers, right? He dropped knowledge. But before that, it was the black men who talked about murdering black men that were the ones that were getting awards. So you could talk about killing a black man all day long and you had a better chance of winning a Grammy there's somebody like Nas. So, the, here's the, 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 like, you know, I look at things from a, a different perspective, right? So, it took black men bodies to be laid out in the street in Mike Brown case for a very long time, hours. You understand me? And it took for, it become political propaganda to where it hurts the institutions that it hurt their bottom line, right? That it take away some of their influence and their capital because America only cares about what? Preservation of wealth and power, capitalism. So once you mess with their bottom line and it became an economic thing, then we say, let's get these people representation so we can continue to have power. I want y'all to just think about that for a second. Think about that for a second. So if you, if you rap about killing niggas, Oh, you can get a Grammy. You understand me? But see, when 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 niggas getting killed, start to mess with our bottom line. Oh, now we need to bring in the positive rappers. Now we need to bring in the, the gods. You understand me? Who care bread a vibration about life? Now you force their hand to where they gotta change their committees that even vote certain albums in. Black death is always the driver in America. You wanna follow the money? Follow the black death. You understand me? So, yeah, you had somebody like D Smoke. You had somebody like Royce Five Nine. You had Freddie Gibbs. You had Jay Electronica. Jay Electronica had the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan on his album. So the moment he got Grammy nominated, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan got Grammy nominated. But the Jews didn't like that. 
They was boycotting. They on his helmet. Like, no, no, sir. No, sir. See, the Grammys represent history. Once you get a Grammy, you get into history. But it also represents an opportunity for that artist to be boosted into a platform to where their music can be seen in a light that it's supposed to in the world. Right? So I'm not mad that Nas won a Grammy. I'm not mad that The Weeknd is boycotting the Grammys. You understand me? Because they both represent the same thing. It represents the influence of the Grammy dying out. Even Nas winning a the Grammy, they never wanted to give Nas a Grammy. Remember that. Never wanted to give Nas a Grammy. So the fact that they hand was forced and they had to give a reparation, that's what I call reparations. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They had to give them some reparations. It still represents their influences dying. Right? Because they were forced to recognize the gods in the space for once. Some black men who actually had something to say. So no, the Grammys is still the institution that we boycott. And by boycott, I, I don't really like that word. It's still an institution that we don't recognize as being influential that validates real artists. But it's not, I'm gonna tell y'all this, the artists, the Grammys will always have influence until we create a better institution. That's like me saying F the colleges but not having the black world order. So you can say F the Grammys and maybe some of you all that's sitting here right here, maybe it's your job to create a better platform because they were started by a group of people. So you can talk about with somebody else's innovation, somebody else's platform, their due diligence to create something for their culture and we mad that we're not recognized for an institution that wasn't created for us in the first place. I'm not mad about them. I'm mad at the fact that we haven't created our own at that high level so that when we recognize each other, it is seen with the same standard. So I want to give congratulations to my bro J Electronica, number one, for because when I was younger, growing up as a young black Muslim male, right? I always thought that I had more targets on my back than anybody, right? People that say that black men have privilege, right? Because we males and this is a male dominated society. So therefore we have privilege. Well, listen, you know, being a black Muslim, masculine male in society, you have more targets than the average person. You understand me? Going in society, it was always felt like going to school, going to my friends, people's house. They try to serve your pork. They try to serve you. A multitude of different things they they didn't understand when we would talk about christianity they didn't understand when we had different perspectives that we arrived to that we sometimes want to listen to different music and we would talk about the world that is and we are speaking a conscious manner and, and be enlightened on certain things you were ostracized and made fun of because there was nothing in culture that taught you to respect it right we had movies like malcolm x but then you have movies like Boys in the Hood and, and a bunch of different uh, uh, other movies that made fun of the conscious person in the movie, the Muslim in the movie. You understand me? So it was always like, oh, you trying to kick knowledge. Oh, you trying to sound smart. Oh, you trying to be conscious. Then it turned out, oh, you woke. Oh, you a hotep. It was no great representation ever of young black Muslim men nowhere in art, film, barely music. Not so when I started to grow up in the 90s, it turned into a bitch hole, nigga gang bang shit. So I missed the wave when it was Rock Kim and them talking about the black God business. Then you had somebody like Lupe Fiasco. He was, he was kicking gang, he was kick pushing, and I found out that he was a Muslim, and I felt like, okay, that's what's up, some representation, right? We grew up in Oakland, California, you had a Scarry X. You understand me? He, 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 he was on that black guy push, he was underground. Somebody I can listen to. Then you had somebody like the Jacka. He was a rapper, he was a street Muslim, which also was kind of like how in Oakland, California, growing up Muslim, we were street Muslims to be honest as well. So I related to some of that, right? Even though he had talked about 
it, 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 it would be contradictory, right? He'd talk about selling dope in one end and then praising a lie in another. So it still wasn't full. It wasn't like, oh, I can fully grasp that. It really wasn't until J Electronica came on the scene, dropped some high level luxury black guy raps that I said like, okay, this a full stream. This a full frequency I can rock with. This a full frequency. You understand me? So when he dropped his album, it was a different level of appreciation because it was like, oh, this is the type of album that I've been waiting for my whole life to represent my belief system, my background. You understand me? And it represented a, a, a shift in the paradigm, right? So to see him get recognized on a high stage, regardless of what you may think about, you know, the Grammys or Jay-Z or Jay Electronica or hip hop or whatever, it only represents a change in the paradigm, a change in the world, a changing of the guards, things shifting around. Exhibit A, C, cold pieces of work. So you have to observe the good, discard the bad, because when you observe the right things, then you grow the right things. You grow the right things. Whatever you water grows, and we water things with attention, right? So there's a beautiful thing that's going on right now. Pay attention to the NFTs from a high level observer's standpoint. You get into the BWO, by the time we have our class, right, me and Derek Grace, where we go over digital wealth, you understand me, and creative business model structures, where we give a little breakdown on some of these NFTs, you will have a background of understanding some of these concepts that we throw at you. And then you can understand also why it's one of the greatest opportunities in the last 100 years for you to be a part of. And this is one of the ways, I'm going to tell y'all the secret, y'all come in a little closer. Look, 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 look closer. Come listen. This is one of the ways that we go build wealth by 2053. Why? Let me see. I'm going to tell y'all why. I'm going to put my glasses on before I say that. See, we gonna build wealth by 2053. Even though we are in the back of the race, right? Francis Crest Wellesley say, hey, we in a race, man. Or was it, um, no, I'm sorry, that's not him. I mean, her, that's um, my other brother. I can't think of his name at the moment, but he said we in a race, black a race, white a race, brown a race. But we in the back of the race, we losing. You understand me? It's a color-coded race. We losing, the power race, the wealth race, the family race, we're losing. So how do you catch up when you're 80 years behind? How do you catch up from a people that have a 400 year head start? Oh man, you need the cheat codes. You understand me? You have to utilize tools, Claude Anderson, thank you. You have to utilize tools that don't give you equality. We don't want equality. We too far behind, if, if we get equality, you understand me? And they 80 years ahead, we still lose. Right? That's 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 like saying, hey, even though you a mile up the block, equality is saying everybody starts at the same speed. Hey, everybody can go hundred miles per hour now. No, they still ahead of me. I'm still not gonna catch up to them. Right? It, it, so we want equity. We saying that listen, that car that's a mile ahead, I need y'all to stop. And I need y'all to let them catch up. But how they go catch up? So we gonna soup up their car. Matter of fact, y'all ain't even gotta stop. We gonna get them a turbo engine. The best driver in the world could drive a car since they gotta represent the race. You know what I'm talking about? And we gonna make sure we clear traffic out so when they're trying to catch up, they can get there faster. And if they happen to go further than y'all and faster than y'all, so be it. That's the reality, right? So black people need to be souped up. We need to be supercharged. We need to take advantage of tools like nobody else. Cryptocurrency has not had mass adoption in a country to where one country particularly is leading the race yet. Now, imagine if we, the diaspora, looked at ourselves as a country and a nation connected to the majority of the population on the planet Earth. And we said that 
how about we decide to take cryptocurrency, blockchains, NFT, these technologies in our possession? So when they looked at the numbers, they can say, well, wait a minute. When we look at who's adopting this faster than any other rate of people, black people around the world are. Now, when we say, okay, how is this going to have effect on their wealth? Well, if we look at the rate of returns that you're getting from these investments on how fast these things are growing, and you can give an actual statistical breakdown on how much each black person in America needs to own a Bitcoin, if we still go by the rate that is being mined, right? And the amount of uh, Bitcoin that will be available for each person to own for you to be wealthy in America, right? How much gold do each person need? All we have to do is change what we focus on, make these the priorities in culture, and we give ourselves equity and we win the race from the rest of the world. But we have to look at it like this. We have to look at it like we're competing with the whole world. We gotta look at what we competing, not China competing with America, black people competing with the world. Mm -mm. We it ain't, it ain't who, if Russia go in, it ain't none of this, our black people go in. Or brown people go in. Some of y'all don't like brown people. I rock with brown people. That was just our brothers with a little bit of, you know, they had extra Spaniards going on. Same situation. Black, brown, red. You know what I'm talking about? Matter of fact, if you a good person, I rock with you. That's just my reality. If you a good person, you righteous, and that's your frequency of thought, I rock with you. But the reason I say black and brown, see, black people have it worse, right? Because by 2053, it said we're going to have 0% wealth. For brown people, by 2073, y'all going to have 0% wealth. So y'all still have 20 years ahead of us. So when I look at the statistics, I'm not speaking it from a standpoint of I'm trying to cut one person. No, I'm saying what are things necessary if we was going to focus from an equity and equality standpoint everybody will say okay black people are first because their situation is more dire right then brown people are next because their situation comes up next so i'm only looking at it from a sequential standpoint of what's necessary based on both of our diagnosis our prognosis of our situation so don't take it personal take it mathematical but i promise you this and i'm gonna get out of here I don't care you're black, you're brown, what color you are. You join the black world order, because black, that's the essence of all colors. When you hear black and you don't see yourself, you disconnected from the original people on the planet Earth. You ain't supposed to hear black and say, oh, that's not for me. <laughs> you supposed to hear black and say, oh, okay. They talking about my origin story. They talking about where I come from. So don't do that. Don't separate yourself from black people ever because we all come from it we all come from it so that black world order yeah it's for all of those who connect with their origin story and want to take it back to the original gangsters on the planet earth the original gods before we had the eyes stacked against us we tapped in man i'm 19 keys make sure y'all join the black world order so we can have wealth in your family and you got education you need to build a skill set to make money on a consistent basis, be, in, be independent of these institutions. And we can validate ourselves with our own awards through the results we get from the education that we receive. Peace. Hold on. Go to blackworldorder.com and become an official member, y'all. Gotta talk to the people. I'm 19 keys. Tap in.